to Collected Talks of David Solomon, podcasts on topics ranging from Jewish history and the Bible to Jewish mysticism, philosophy, and thought. To find out about David's talks, books, and more, visit davidsolomon.online. And now, here's the lecture. There's two reasons I can see why we're going to do the topic we're going to cover in the next four weeks. Uh, it's called the two temples, and really what we're going to look at is precisely that. We're going to look at the two temple periods in some detail. Basically a thousand year period in about four talks. Uh, so each of those 500 year periods, the first temple and the 500 year period of the second temple, we'll spend two talks on using the temple in Jerusalem as the focus of what we're going to discuss. So this is Jewish history with a focus, but it's not a random focus. There's a very, very good reason that I hope will become clear from what we talk about as to why we're going to do that. The second reason we are going to do that and why I suggested it uh, to Rabbi Groner is because we're going to be doing it in the lead up to uh, the whole period of the three weeks culminating into Shabbat, which is, of course, the commemoration of the destruction of both temples. And sometimes, kind of two millennia further on, It's sometimes difficult for us to remind ourselves consciously about why that still occupies such an important place in the Jewish calendar, Uh, whether whether or not you are someone who is kind of ritually immersed in Judaism, even from a historical perspective, Tisha B'Av has always been an important day, and it's focused on the destruction of the temples in Jerusalem. So that's a little couple of minutes of content absence just to start. Uh, to give a context as to what we're going to be doing. The kings of Judah are the ideal framework by which we can get our head around the period we're going to talk about. The old timeline. All right. I'm going to do this one first. Zero. 2000. That's us. Minus 2000. 1000 BCE. 1000 CE and we'll fill in the 500s everybody follow that's the 4000 year span yeah where in this is King David very good 1000 BCE very very good I just I know I know it's very simple and I know it makes us feel over back at school but it really really need to contextualize that so that we absolutely clear right the period we're going to talk about in the first two talks is what we call buy it what's the meaning of the word buy it house buy it rishon this is the first temple period and we'll talk about what the temple is in a moment but i want us to know exactly where we're going and king david who really kind of starts the temple project he doesn't build the temple King David did not build the temple, but he started the project. He started the idea. He started conceptualizing what it would mean to have an institution and a location like that in his newly chosen capital of Jerusalem. That is around about 1000 BCE, not long after David captures Jerusalem and turns it into that capital city. Now, I'm going to wipe this, I'm going to wipe this, and we're going to zoom in on that period. But for the purpose of tonight's talk, I'm going to go from roundabout minus 1000, and I'm going to call this minus 700. There is a natural break line, fault line within this period. And so it's very easy for me to be able to divide it up to know what to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about the first 300 years of this 500 year block. Everybody follow? God never asked the people of Israel, a.k.a. the Jewish people, to build him, her, it, a house. God never demanded or asked for a temple. Those of you who think otherwise can read a book called Tanakh. 
the prophets tell you again and again. I brought you out of Egypt. I made you a nation. I made a covenant with you. You have a purpose in the world. I never asked you to build me a house. There is, of course, this notion of a special place. Bamakom asher yivchar, says the Torah, in the place where God will cho choose. In some reference to what will probably be a kind of, at some point, God will indicate that this particular place is desirable for a focus of worship. But at no point was there a demand by God for us to build a temple to house the divine. Because the Jewish concept of God is ultimately that the divine cannot be housed in a building. Ezevayit asher tivnu li, says the prophet, using the words of God. What kind of house could you possibly build for me when I, my glory fills the entire universe? Nevertheless... The extremely important figure of King David here, who is not really the subject of tonight's talk, but whose kind of project overshadows the entire period, in gratitude to God, and having... You see, David did something very interesting. This is a really important thematic point in history that I want us to try and... Um, and understand when David captured Jerusalem from the Jebusites and decided this is an outstanding place central well located a whole amazing energy going on here and there was then as there is now this is the ideal place right near the borders of various tribes the and the north and the south this is the place to make the capital of Israel he then shortly after decided to bring to Jerusalem the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a very, very sacred uh, artifact. It had legendarily been built by the generation that had come out of Egypt. It sat in the sanctuary, wherever the sanctuary was, wherever the priests and the prophets had decided was the place where the ark should reside. It had traditionally been there. As it happens, for the last quite a while, a couple of centuries, it has sat at a place called Shiloh. And then, as a result of what happened during the preceding generations, it had moved from Shiloh and was in various other places. Uh, and David decided, once he had this brand new shining capital city, that he was going to bring the Ark of the Covenant and the Sanctuary of the Lord, which we call the Mishkan or the Mikdash, he was going to bring it to Jerusalem. That is an event that most people, when they read about it, and they go, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, he's got the big capital city. He brings the Ark of the Covenant, makes the religious center into the capital city. But that's a very, very impactful thing to do and in some ways counter to the narrative because there had been until then a separation of religious and political authorities. During the previous period of Jewish history, the period of the judges and so on, the sanctuary had sat at Shiloh where the priests functioned but the political centers were elsewhere. Places like Gilgal or Mitzpeh or Ramah. So to bring the two together was about to create a theme that really, really would influence the whole of this period that the religious and the political centers were now aligned. There's no question that with the backing of a religious center that... <coughs> Israel could now become effectively a pure theocracy. The king and the priesthood ideally were to work hand in hand. It wasn't necessarily, it didn't necessarily have to be that way. That was a conscious decision of King David. So he's sitting there, but he's got the, he's got the Ark of the Covenant inside the tabernacle, this portable sanctuary, 
sitting not far from where he is in Jerusalem. And bear in mind, and uh, so who has been to Jerusalem? Outstanding. Everybody's familiar with the old city. So people go, ah, oh, the old city, right? Not where the, you know, the, the light rail goes and where all the other shops are and all the rest of it and the, the new shopping gallery out at Malcolm, well, I can go and get this and that. No, 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 the old city of Jerusalem, people think that is synonymous with the biblical old city of Jerusalem. But the old city is actually quite late. I'll draw a schematic, <laughs> and it is a very rough schematic, but here's, here's how we go. So let's say the old city looks something like that. All right? You've got your gates around it, yeah? For those of you who are confused, there's Rukhov Yafu going down like that, all right? And the, and the falafel shop's right there. <laughs> so in the context of that, this is the Valley of Kidron. On the other side, in other words, here, here is the Temple Mount. Follow? There's the Laksa. More like that. There's the Dome of the Rock. Yep. So we know that's the Temple Mount. That humongous platform that it sits on, the actual shape of the Temple Mount, and the platform it sits on was built by none other than our favorite dude, Herod. Here's the valley of the Kidron. You go down and then right here is what? The Mount of Olives. There's Mount Scopus. Yeah, that's Haraman Uchav. There's the Mount of Olives. Yep, with the Seven Arches Hotel up the top. And then on the other side of that is basically the Judean desert. Because the city of Jerusalem, amazingly, sits right smack on the fault line of three continents. It's literally, geologically divided. Here you've got the western plateau of the Levant leading onto the Mediterranean. Here you've got the Judean desert. And as soon as you go 100 meters that way, you're in Asia. Go this way, and you're in Africa. Go that way, <coughs> towards Lebanon and Turkey, and you're almost in Europe. That's it. The city of David. When we talk about Ir David. And this, of course, this old city has grown incrementally in stages throughout the biblical and period and beyond. Even the old city itself wasn't even as big as that in the times of the Bible, but some of it did exist. But at the time that we're talking about here in 1000 BCE, the city of David is effectively, well, here's the retaining wall of the Temple Mount. What do we call the retaining wall of the Temple Mount? The Kotel. Here's your plaza. You go out here. Everybody following what I'm saying? Yes. You go out here. There's that thing. You pass all the minion security guys and the, and the Haredim and their kids. Yes. You pass the Dung Gate and then you come out. And then you cross the road. And then you are in the old city of David, which in relative size is about that. And then you've got, once again, on, over here, you've got the Silwan. No, the Tower of David is here. Yeah. And the, what we call the Tower of David is not quite the Tower of David. It was built by these people called the Romans. But here, Silwan. So everybody's familiar with what I'm talking. Yes. It's on a slope. Yeah. And they have been crawling all over it. Archaeologists and historians have been crawling all over it for quite a while. I know, because I've done some of the crawling myself. <laughs> and the more they dig, the more interesting it is and the more they find. That's David's Jerusalem, and the rest of it was pretty much open. It was Jebusite elements around here. So that as we find, if you open the book of Shmuel, the book of Samuel, which are the biblical books that cover the career, the life and career of King David, right at the very, very end, 
in the last chapter, in fact, the last few verses of the last chapter of the second book of Samuel is where you will find that there is a plague. And of course, that has a whole concept behind it, that plague. It comes, what the Bible tells us, it comes about as a punishment for David having counted the people. And there's a whole story there and you can read it, but David takes great notice of the place where the plague stopped. And it stopped <coughs> on a threshing floor owned by a Jebusite guy called Aravna. Uh, there are quite a few uh, commentators and uh, people who see insights there that want to tell us that Aravna was actually not just any old Jebusite guy, he was actually uh, the last remaining king of the Jebusites, which was kind of like a testament to David's uh, policy of tolerance for anyone that uh, was a law-abiding citizen and kept the war, uh, kept the law. I mean, David was not you know, racist or xenophobic in that sense. He was quite happy for even not just Jebusites, even the king of the Jebusites to have property and maintain. So Aravna had a threshing floor around about here. And that was the first sign that David realized that that was a very special place. And why, why, was, why was that a very good place for a threshing floor? Yeah. Anyone, anyone done any threshing? <laughs> well, a threshing floor, you see, you see, in the ancient world, right, wheat didn't come in little plastic packets from the supermarket, as you would be aware. It, you had to, it came as a grain inside a husk and chaff and you had to separate it all out. And the way for thousands of years all over the world, the way they would do that is you find a nice area that's flat and preferably open to a breeze. And you have a whole setup there where you are banging the grains up and down and onto the floor and whatever and over the course of them just being circulated throughout uh, the air and the floor and whatever the grain would separate from its husk and so on. It's a, it's a very very ancient practice and that's why that was an ideal location. David then told by the prophet Gad, go up there, purchase that place because that's the place that's going to be where your temple that you want is going to be built. David had asked God to build a temple, if he could build a temple, because David had been lying in bed at night in his beautiful new cedar house, and the temple was kind of outside in some portable tent. And he wanted to build a temple to God. God says, I didn't ask you for a temple, but if you are going to build one, uh, <laughs> make it a nice piece of real estate, and, um, but it's not, you're not going to build it. God famously said to David, you're not going to build it. Uh, people don't realize sometimes that the reason God said you're not going to build it <laughs> is not found in the book of Samuel. In the book of Samuel, God says to him through the prophet, much more kind of diplomatically, you know, you, you've done a lot of things. You're busy. I mean, it's okay. We'll leave it to your descendants to build it. Whereas if you look at Divrei Hayamim, in the book of Chronicles, where the same vision, version is given over, is where we get the famous reason that everybody knows. And what is that? Sorry? That's right. Because he had bloodshed on his hands. Which um, is a remark that shows the different kind of focus and agenda of the authors of the book of Chronicles from the authors of the book of Spoil. It's extremely interesting. It's quite a kind of what we might call today an extremely sort of enlightened left-wing position to take, you know, like that the people responsible for the violent establishment of their political entity are not, should not be the people who then establish its spiritual edifices. It was, of course, King David's son. And just bear in mind, when I talk about Aravna, the Jebusite, who sold the land to David, David went up there and he said, I'll give it to you. David goes, no, I want to buy it. And he goes, well, I've got a whole lot of other stuff. Let me give you all the wood and the animals you need for sacrifices. David goes, no, I want to buy them. Thereby forever establishing the precedent that you cannot sacrifice to God that which you do not own and that which you have not acquired. We'll talk about sacrifice in a moment. King David's son, King Solomon, on that particular area, builds a temple.
And so that is generally regarded as having happened at some way in the midpoint in the 10th century. He builds a temple. Now, it did not look like that. But he builds, and it's not referred to as Beit HaMikdash, as we refer to it today. It wasn't known. People didn't go around in Israel talking about, in ancient Israel, talking about the Beit HaMikdash. It wasn't called the Beit HaMikdash. It was called the Beit Hashem, the house of God. And in fact, in the unbelievable prayer uttered by King Solomon at the dedication of the temple, he actually refers to it in its ultimate sense as a Beit Tfilah L'chol Ha'amim, as a house of prayer for all nations. The Solomonic picture of the temple that he inherited from his father was not just a temple dedicated to the spiritual conquests of the people of Israel, but was an invitation to all human beings, all nations, to come to Jerusalem, which would be the centralized place of worship for the world. It was much more ambitious even than we realize. It is a huge light and window on the original universalist um, aspirations of Judaism. Now, here's where I'm going to digress for a second, and I'm going to tell you some things that are going to annoy you. And they're going to annoy you, and they're going to upset you. And they're going to make Rabbi Groner cry. <laughs> but, no, they're not. Okay. No, but I'm going, to ha I'm going to have to be very honest. I have to be very honest. We don't know. We don't know. We do not have any archaeological proof of this temple. couple of reasons behind that. The first is that we don't. And the second thing is, is that it's very difficult for us, and has been for a long, long time, to do any, uh, difficult for anyone, to do any archaeological excavations underneath the Temple Mount for obvious reasons. So to start actually digging and poking around, in the Temple Mount, in the most sensitive piece of real estate in the world, bar none, is a very difficult proposition. And the only accounts we have of the Temple and of the Solomonic Temple come from the Bible. And as I've said before, that does not mean the Bible, we haven't found anything inconsistent in the Bible with the reality as we understand it. And the Bible is remarkable in its ability to give us a picture of ancient times that it's almost inconceivable how it could have given that picture if it wasn't writing first-hand events. Nevertheless, if you only have one source, you only have one source. We could back it up by archaeological evidence, but we can't get at it. But we understand more or less what the Solomonic Temple looked like and the latest uh, sort of archaeological pictures we have, we know from the Tanakh that it was divided into basically three parts. There was the Holy of Holies, which was called the Devir. There was the Heichal, which was like, kind of like your main, main kind of sanctuary where most of the action and interesting things happened. And then you had a portico. And then there might have been some areas around which were for the general populace. And this might have been this whole thing might have been maybe 60 meters in length and we know that there are different scholars are telling us so many different, some say oh that's an Egyptian form some say oh that's a Phoenician form some people say, oh no that's very similar to other early Iron Age buildings that are found in Syria and so on but the reality is is that apart from the most rudimentary description given us to us in the Bible we're not entirely sure what it looked like Remember that in Jerusalem of the ancient world, when you came into Jerusalem, you went up to the temple. What happens when you come now through the shuk? You're going down. And it's the climb back from the kotel. Where you're <laughs> right? It was the other way around. So obviously, over 2,000 years, the layers have built up. Let me give you uh, an example of what they did do. Some of you would be familiar with this, what they did a few years ago. They did a very clever trick. 
they flew a helicopter mm. over the Temple Mount at dawn. And using infrared, they mapped out the contours of the ground according to what, how the rocks were warming up when the sun came up. Yeah? And then you can get kind of a layered map. It's a brilliant idea. And what did they find? Anyone remember what they found? This was, I think, done in the late 90s. Anyone remember what they found? They found at the foundation level of where they were hoping to find evidence of the first temple, they found the foundation of a temple, but it was a temple to Astarte. Now, on the one hand, some secular scholars were saying, Ah, oh, you see, we told you. Whereas others were saying, Actually, why don't you read Tanakh? Tanakh tells you that again and again and again, right throughout this biblical period, people were building edifices to idolatrous cults all over the Temple Mount. What do you think was driving the prophets nuts? So nothing that we're finding is inconsistent with the Tanakh narrative, but we have not yet found the foundation of King Solomon's Temple. Maybe it's deeper, we don't know. When King Solomon, it took him, uh, took him seven years to build it, and he built it with the help of local allies, such as Hiram, the king of the Lebanon, and so on, and they built it using um, cedars, and, but, but they, 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 he really, he spared no expense. Remember that King Solomon inherited a united kingdom from his father that was effectively a regional superpower. And it's interesting because they're obviously in alliance with a number of the different growing civilizations around the Middle East at the time because there's only one place in the ancient world that that amount of silver was coming from and that was either Spain or Sardinia. So they must have had connections with Phoenicians who were doing shipping right across the Mediterranean. It really, really was an impressive building. And they used a lot of different elements and architectural features that were current at the time and by all accounts it was stunning. It took him seven years to build and then read chapter 8 of the book of Kings and you will see the immense, as I've alluded to before, the incredible dedication prayer at the, at the opening ceremonies of the temple which lasted for two weeks they slaughtered over 20,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep. So the Bible tells us. Has anyone ever been to a giant industrial abattoir today? You would know that that amount of cattle and sheep in a two week period, you've got a lot of people working, especially if it's not mechanized and so on, right? Your great big Ex the big export abattoirs in Australia, for example, today would be doing like maybe 800 head of cattle a day. So you can imagine that. Now, interestingly, that period of... We'll get on to sacrifice in a second. I can see some of you looking a bit squeamish and going, really? This is kind of what I'm meant to get inspired by, that Solomon was like slaughtering tens of thousands or whatever. Under that in a sec. But when did these festivities end? They lasted for two weeks. When did they end? And I mention this because when we come to do the second temple dedication, it's very interesting to compare. When did those two weeks end? Anyone know? I'll tell you. They ended on Shmini Atzeret, on the last day of the festival of Sukkot. All right? And you go, okay, David, very interesting. Yeah, so, so. Well, go back two weeks. Right? They started on Erev Yom Kippur. They started on the eve of Yom Kippur. So you're going, um, really? In other words, in that year, Yom Kippur was suspended. This year, on Yom Kippur, we'll be eating steak. Such was the, and there's also obviously the commentators and the rabbis are all over there trying to explain that one, but it was an immense event. All right. Now, 
King Solomon therefore reigned for 40 years. I think he built that pretty early on in his kingship and it's an immense building and it suddenly becomes the religious and political focus of the nation. Well, the political is still vested within the kingship, but they are now very much in proximity together. And we're going to see that emerge in this period shortly. Uh, there's a very interesting, if you go to the city of David today, you'll see what they believe it to be this edifice. There's a, there's a structure that is mentioned in the biblical narrative that no one knows what it is. You see, in archaeology, and I, I don't want to digress for too much, but just let me tell you, in contemporary archaeology, the big debate in contemporary biblical archaeology is this. As I'm sure anyone read occasionally on biblical archaeology, and you'll know that this is the main, the main debate, um, conceptually, in theory. Do we look at objects that we find in the Holy Land and say, oh, the Bible talks about this, I found this, therefore this must be this. Or, do you find an object and go, I wonder what that is. I've got no idea what that object is. And that that the Bible is talking about, that's just one possible perspective on what this might be. But unless I have some other way of determining what it is, the Bible, I'm not going to privilege the Bible any more than any other kind of evidence or insight into what this object might be. But there is a structure mentioned in the Bible a few times, and we're not sure what it is. It's called the Milo. And it sits at the foot of the city of David in all these excavations here. By the way, there is another very, very important geological feature here that has been very important in the subsistence of Jerusalem for millennia. And that, of course, is the spring of Gihon. That we're not entirely sure what the source of that spring is, but we do know that it collects from the Judean desert. And you, it's so loud you can hear it and it runs underground. And that water source has been incredibly important in Jerusalem's history. Don't drink it. There's something that the Iriah of Jerusalem has yet to work out in terms of the relationship between the sewerage coming out of Silwan and the spring of Gihon. I know people that have been sick for a couple of days just by immersing in it. But, well, because for a few, a few years ago they found the, um, I was there, they found the mikvah of the high priest from the temple. So it's a big deal to go and go into that mikvah <laughs> and I went into the mikvah and I was sick for two days uh, so here is some sort of concrete brick structure called the milo and a lot of scholars believe that this edifice in the bible referred to as the milo is that thing that they have now found but whatever it is we don't know it was I mean spelt mem lamad vav alaf so it maybe comes from the word male meaning to fill so maybe it's kind of like, we're not entirely sure what it is, but it's kind of like a, a, a stepped wall rampart thing. And during the time of King Solomon, he closed it up and he made it a tax for people to go through it. That caused tremendous social and political unrest and was one of the symptoms of what was going wrong during the Solomonic reign. He was a great king, effectively turned Israel into an empire had trade and commercial contracts right throughout the known world. But all was not well in his kingdom. And the Bible will tell you, it will give you a surface narrative. And that is that even though he was very, very smart, he was a bit too smart. And he started making all sorts of alliances and ended up with a thousand wives, which is kind of like the definition of high maintenance. And then, basically, a lot of these wives were demanding the presence of their own local or houses of worship to their own deities. And Solomon, even though he was brilliant, had kind of forgotten that God had said to him, that's probably not a good idea. And that then led to a kind of erosion towards the end of his reign. So that when he died, his son... King Solomon's son, 
Rehavam, in English Rehaboam, emerges. So here's Solomon. And here's Rehavam. And when Rehavam emerges, the people go to him at the big crowning conference. They're basically like, kind of like a national conference. So they come to him and they say to him, it wouldn't be a bad idea if you gave the people a bit of a break. You know, your father was a great king, but he worked us really hard. We had to build and we were taxed and we had to do this and we had to do that. We were building up this infrastructure of this amazing state that your father created. But if you give these people a little bit of lenience, a bit of a break, they will love you forever. He was advised about that by the elder counsellors. But then Rehavam, being the shtickle idiot he was, he goes and he confers with his own colleagues of his own young age, the guy that he grew up with, and they turn around and said to him, nonsense, they're just lazy. And the only way you're going to get their respect is if you are tough. So he comes out and he gives that famous speech, you know, my little finger is thicker than my father's whatnot. Right? He actually says that. And he goes, and you know what? I'm going to work you even harder. That then caused the rebellion by a fascinating figure called you know, Rehavam is the king in Judah, in, in Israel. He's the new king, takes over after Solomon. But then a guy who could really only be described as kind of some sort of militant union leader called Yerovam or Jeroboam takes the ten of the tribes and forms their own kingdom in the north. There's the land of Israel, there's Jerusalem, boom, 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 boom. So for the rest of this period, we have two separate kingdoms. We have the kingdom of Israel and we have the kingdom of Judah. And the first thing that Yerovam realizes is that he can't have a situation where the people in his kingdom, because he set himself up as a kingdom, he's called a king, are going to go to Jerusalem for their spiritual worship and their spiritual focus. He has to create a counter to that. Everybody follow? By the way, this rebellion that split the kingdom of Israel was sanctioned by God. God told Yeruvam to do it. He told it to him, interestingly enough, via who? A prophet. Which prophet? Anyone know? Anyone know the prophet that was told by God to go to Yeruvam and say, you know what, take the ten tribes, set up your own kingdom. You're right, Rehavam's an idiot. That was a prophet called Achia Hashiloni. Achia Hashiloni, ah, amazingly, was the acclaimed, much, 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 much later in the 18th century CE, with the great dissension caused by the Hasidic split, and the Baal Shem Tov claimed that his teacher, spiritual teacher, was Achia Hashiloni. The biblical figure, which is really interesting when you compare the kind of, because at the end of the day, like it or not, the Hasidic movement was uh, a very much a big dissenting movement. Now, what does he do? Yerevan, what does he do? He has to set up a spiritual center. What does he do? No, he doesn't build another temple. He does something remarkable. At two centers in his kingdom, one in the south in Beth El and one in the north in Dan, he sets up two massive altars and on these altars are, <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm about to draw it and uh, you, you have no idea, you have no idea, you have no, Michelangelo I am not. He. Two golden calves. One here, one here. And it's like the golden calves at these two axis points in his kingdom are a symmetry of the two cherubim inside the Holy of Holies that are in the Temple of Jerusalem. 
Now what's fascinating is that the rabbis will come along in the Talmud and they will tell you that Jeroboam was the greatest Torah scholar of the whole of the biblical period. They have a big thing about that. So you think to yourself, how could someone who the rabbis regard as the greatest Torah scholar of the biblical period not apparently have read the book of Exodus? And it's important to realize that it's not just the case that there's something hardwired into the Jewish brain about a golden calf. It's like meh, 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 when we see it. But that the golden calf, even though it was idolatry, right throughout the biblical period, was, sorry, was treated very differently by the prophets of Israel and by God. It wasn't liked, but it was kind of tolerated for the time being because yes it was idolatry but it was our idolatry <laughs> these golden calves were representative of the God of Israel Yisrael. these are your gods O Israel in other words it was a different form of Judaism but the God was the God of Israel very warped thing to uh, understand. I'm not, I'm not advocating that they were really liked, but they were, but they were a little more tolerated than some of the other foreign cults that subsequently got imported. And so that's going on, and for most of the first generations, these two kingdoms are at war. In fact, one of the first things that, you know, um, that Rehavam does is he goes northwards with an army of nearly 200,000 men to try and recapture the northern kingdom until he's told by one of the prophets uh, it's not going to happen don't do it just go back to Jerusalem and keep your peace they were at war and that whole thing in other words these guys were driven the Judeans were always seen as driven by a different intensity the character of the North was always, let's just make as much money as we can, let's get on with our life, let's raise our standard of living, let's have a good material existence here in Samaria, right? We don't really want to fight wars, I mean, we have to if we have to, right? First world problems. <coughs> and in subsequent laws, if you go a couple of centuries later, as we'll see, um, when they tried the same trick, they got schmeist. Rukhavam dies and he's succeeded by Aviyam. Aviyam is succeeded by Asa and Asa is succeeded by Yehoshaphat. Those first four generations of the Solomonic Temple in Judah are really the first phase. They're a very, very established kingdom. In the north, it's very, very different. The main mode of succession to the kingdom in the north was by violent assassination. If you wake up on a Monday morning and you want to be the king, you take your best dagger, you get as close to the king as you can, you stab the king, and then as so long as you've got enough people who like you, then by around three that afternoon, you'll be the king. And that's basically how it was for the first few generations in the Northern Kingdom. There were a couple of occasions where a father-son combination was able to happen, but no more than that. One king, and any, basically most of the kings were coming from the army. They were commanders. They got up. They said, I want to be king. And that's exactly what they did. And that situation goes on in the northern kingdom until the rise of the first really important king of the northern kingdom. A guy who is going to establish a house and a dynasty that's going to last for several generations and who is an extremely important figure in Jewish history and world history and his name is Omri and Omri is super important because Omri is the first person of the entire biblical narrative to be named in a document external to the Bible He's on the Mesha Stele, he's on the Black Obelisk, paying, having relations with different uh, kingdoms and kings around the Middle East. Omri has a son, a famous son. Who is Omri's famous son? Son of Omri. Outstanding. <laughs> outstanding. Absolutely outstanding. But, but, but his son, in fact, is... Ahav, who we know in English 
as Ahab. Not looking for a whale, but he's there. He's the son of Omri. Ahab is a contemporary of Jehoshaphat in the south. These of this incredibly stable dynasty, the southern dynasty was very, very stable for those first few generations. By now, they're no longer at war. And Jehoshaphat, who, by the way, is the first king, not only, uh, is really the first king to use Jerusalem as a spiritual center by which people were sent out right throughout the country to remind people about keeping the sabbatical years, about teaching people the foundations of Jewish spirituality. Jehoshaphat's a very interesting figure, but he's a contemporary of Ahav, and they decide that they will have an alliance. Now, the concept of alliance with nations around is not a terribly new idea, but it's really starting to take hold between these two kingdoms, and not only between these two, but between the kingdoms around them. Ahav himself was married as part of an alliance, because he'd been married by his father Omri, to whom, famously, when I say this person's name, you're going to go, oh. Ahav was married in an arranged marriage organized by his father to the daughter of the Phoenician priest of the cult of Baal called Jezebel. Oh. <laughs> the daughter of Ed Baal. Now, that's why it's important to understand that these guys here, up here in the northern Lebanon, the Phoenicians. We could spend this entire talk on the Phoenicians, as I'm sure you're aware. They're amazingly complex and interesting, fascinating force in the ancient world. They were the ones quite very technologically advanced for their age and with trade routes all around. And they had basically taken on the religion of Baal. Baal is not, was not localized just to Phoenicia. Baal and forms of Baal worship, they actually had the milk cart form of Baal, but the Baal form of worship was right across the Middle East and was going to go on to have echoes in Greek mythology and all of that emerges from this incredible Semitic synthesis between some of the older Kanana elements and as well as the new kind of wave of idolatry and mythology that was emerging. But Baal was effectively, well, we know Baal mythologically as, you know, the son of El, he's a hero, he's a storm god, he's, uh, he's, he sometimes goes away, he sometimes comes back. Uh, very, very strange forms of worship that um, did not look like your average shul service. But Isabel brings the Baalist cult into the Northern Kingdom. And Ahav is quite happy to encourage that. Now, now, the Northern Kingdom has got a solidification of spiritual and political power. And now we really do set up, not only are we talking about different political entities, we are talking about a great variance of spiritual perspectives. As the prophets were saying again and again, and that is why it is during the time of Ahav and Izebel that we see the rise of the greatest prophet of the prophetic tradition, who is Elijah. And as Elijah and his follower Elisha and the other prophets around them were making them it clear, where you have idol worship, you have social injustice. And where you have social injustice, you have idol worship. Idol worship is the pursuit of personal power. And some of the acts of Ahav were horrendous in the appropriation of resources, in the oppression of the underprivileged in society in the name of power. And that is why, that is why after four generations, the house of Omri was destroyed by a person appointed by the prophets. But just before we get to that, Ahav and Jehoshaphat made an alliance and Ahav and Izebel's daughter, some very, very important women in this period, and if I'm doing it here, that's roughly what it is on the timeline, Ahav and Izebel's daughter, Atalia, marries 
the son of Yehoshaphat, Yehoram. Now Yehoram dies and their son Ahaziah comes to the throne and Ahaziah is in alliance with Ahav at the time that the prophets appoint a new guy to completely start again in the northern kingdom. He's told that the house of Omri has angered God so much it's going to end and it's your job to do it. And that person, of course, is the biggest psychopathic murderer in the whole of biblical narrative. His name is Yehu. And Yehu is a guy who effectively kills everyone he meets. Hi, Yehu. How are you? <coughs> he kills he kills Ahav, he kills Jezebel, he kills the whole of the royal family in the north, he kills anyone who ever went to a Kiddush at their place, he kills 400 prophets of Baal, he kills, he also he even kills the king of Yehuda. he kills Ahaziah when Ahaziah was visiting and so on, he kills everyone. That, and then set up his own dynasty of course, the Yehu dynasty. The Yehu dynasty is chuffing along in the north, but a power vacuum, because the king of Yehuda is being killed by Yehu as well, there's a power vacuum in the south. And who takes control? It's so Game of Thrones. It's not. Who takes control? Atalia. And Atalia comes in, pronounces herself as queen of the southern kingdom, and immediately goes about slaughtering every individual she can find of the house of David of the Davidic dynasty, including her own grandchildren, searches them out and kills them. Only one baby survived. That baby survived, a woman called Yehosheva, the wife of the high priest Yehoiada, and they hid that child in the temple, in a little room off the Holy of Holies. They hid that child for seven years until they brought the child out. And when he was kind of old enough to parade around, they brought him out and they crowned him king in front of the mob. And then the mob went spectacular and hunted down Atalia and tore her to pieces. That then restored the Davidic dynasty. And so here we have, he's known in English as Joash, Yehoash. Now, because Yehoash had grown up in the temple, I dropped it, I know I dropped it. Yehoash had grown up in the temple, he was quite sympathetic to the whole thing going on in the temple, and he decided that he would make some structural renovations and some extensive maintenance. Because at the end of the day, how was the temple maintained? Who was there to maintain it? And if it was the priests, how was that paid for? Anyone remember how that is paid for, the maintenance of the temple? Not through the tithing. The tithing was, it went in a different direction. Sacrifice. No, it, you, as soon as I say it, you go, oh, right? It was the half shekel donation made by every person. And they would donate half a shekel every year. And that was for the purpose of the upkeep of the temple. The problem was, when Joash turned around, once he was old enough and he wanted to start doing these maintenance, he goes, well, where's the money? And it turns out that all of those funds had not really been collectively centralized. And, you know, the matter of collecting it was kind of a bit loose and each priest would kind of get it off someone they knew and, you know, whatever. And then if they saw a maintenance issue, they would spend money on it. It was kind of, you know, it was sort of, it was very loose. And it was Yehoash really who reformed that system. From now on, maintenance funds will be collectively placed and it's not going to go to the priests it's going to come into the central maintenance authority for the temple and so on and in the course of that now that's all very well but as Yehoash gets older the priests are starting to make a power play in Jerusalem and those tensions become significant Yehoash even has a dissenting priest murdered inside the temple precinct itself and that caused so much hassle that eventually Yehoash himself is assassinated by his servants in revenge for that. Yehoash is therefore succeeded by his son, Amatsya. And Amatsya 
Amatsya is a guy who decides that he is going to be the big king again. He takes his army and he goes down to Edom. Oh, where's the land of Israel? He goes down to Edom. And he conquers Edom. And he kills 10,000 guys on the, on the battlefield. And then he takes another 10,000 Edomites and he throws them off a cliff. And God turns around through the prophets and says to him, that is a war crime. God of Israel does not tolerate war crimes. There is an understanding that you need to go to war at various times. There is an understanding that sometimes you're even commanded to go to war. But to take 10,000 guys that you've already captured and take them to the top of a cliff and throw them off, not on. Amatsya then tried to attack with his army, but he nevertheless went back and defeated Edom. Then he tried with his army to attack the northern kingdom. And the king of the northern kingdom of the time, confusingly, a guy called Yehoash, turns around and says to him, don't do that. I'll squish you like a bug. And Amatsya goes, no, I'm going to come and get you. He goes, come on, man. I mean, yeah, that's what it's like when you read the Bible. Read chapter 14 of the second book of Kings. It's amazing. So he goes up there and he gets squished like a bug. Amatsya is also killed. These kings, I mean, giving you a tremendous summary, but I'm showing you the turmoil. And then Amatsya's son is, of course, the famous and powerful and stable Uzziah. Uzziah rules for like half a century. Very peaceful prosperous time. His contemporary in the north is the last king of the Yehu dynasty, who is Jeroboam II. Just to show you what the Yehu dynasty was doing, it had removed the Baalist cult, but was returning to kind of the original northern kingdom ideology. Jeroboam II's reign in the north was very prosperous and stable, even if it was socially and economically corrupt. And Uzziah's in the south was a stable, prosperous, and military secure reign. But one morning, Uzziah turns up in the temple. And here really, this is such an important story. It is the absolute highlight of what exactly is the issue in the rising tensions in Jerusalem, in the temple, and in Jewish history at this time. He goes into the temple and he says, Today, I, the king... I'm going to offer the incense on the altar, on the incense altar. That's a particular ritual that happens in the temple. <coughs> and the priest said, uh, no, you're not. Because the priests do that. You're not the priest, you're the king. And he said, actually, you're right. I'm the king. Therefore, what I say is going to happen. And they said, well... There's kind of 80 priests standing between you and the incense altar who are not going to let that happen. And Uzziah is basically saying, well, I've got about the same number of uh, armed soldiers with me that are going to say it is going to happen. And eventually Uzziah walks over and picks up the incense and is about to walk over to the altar to put it on. When suddenly... <laughs> well... <laughs> We know this from the geological records as well. The Bible doesn't specifically mention this, but there is an earthquake. And there's an earthquake that legend tells us happened exactly at that moment. And that coincides kind of with where geologists have told us definitely there was a massive earthquake. But there's a kind of crack in the wall of the building of the temple. The sun suddenly bursts through it onto Uzziah's face. He turns around and everyone goes, <gasps> because he is instantly leprous. He obviously, as a leper, now has to not only leave the temple, he's got to immediately leave the city. And he sits outside the city for the next few years as a leper king, while his son sits on the throne as regent. His son. But that, that story is so important because that's a crack in the whole tension that he's building between the political influence and power of the growing priesthood and the power asserted by the kings. By the way, 
where in Judaism ultimately does power reside? Does it reside with the king or does it reside with the high priest? Well, I'll tell you. Neither. In terms of human affairs, the ideal is that power ultimately rests with the prophetic class. Because the prophets only become prophets because they completely renounce the concept of power. That is ideally expressed in the life and career of Moses and is shown again and again and again. If you go fast forward in history and you look at a Greek thinker like Plato who talks about the philosopher class really being the ideal uh, repository of political power because they are the wise, in, there is a similar thing going on in Jewish thought except that the prophets are the repository of power precisely because they are a class of no power. It's a fascinating uh, interplay. So, Uziah is succeeded by Yotam. Yotam is king, not the first time that you've had a regent in the city, or the first time, not the only time when you've got a leper king outside, happened again during the Crusades, much, much later. Anyone know what's unique about Yotam? Jotham, as he's called. You know. Yotam is the only king in the Bible about whom the biblical narrative has nothing negative to say whatsoever. The only king, including King David, including all of them. Later, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the legendary author of the Zohar, said, I, meaning himself, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, together with the righteous king Yotam, the two of us together could atone for the sins of all generations. That's how righteous we are. Yotam was... Perfect. But, as so often happens, some of the most righteous kings, and we see this again and again in Jewish history, some of the most righteous leaders are succeeded by complete shlemils. And sometimes those shlemils are even naughty shlemils. Your time is succeeded by Ahaz. And Ahaz is a very different king. Ahaz is now under pressure. Ahaz is now under pressure from a growing entity here, roughly where Syria is today. A nation that's no longer with us. A nation called Aram. Aram was a very powerful dynasty at that time, had been growing in influence, looked at itself as a bit of a handy shtickel empire possibly going on there. Aram might have been a very, very different political entity throughout history. And they were constantly threatening the northern kingdom. And when they were in alliance with the northern kingdom, they were threatening the southern kingdom. This is now the period of some of our mainline prophets, such as Isaiah, who is counseling Ahaz not to worry about things. And Ahaz nevertheless is worried about things. And therefore, he, to counter that alliance that's going to invade Judah, he circumvents that and goes over here to speak to the big daddy power that is about to well up in the area and that is at a totally different level. He goes and pays a lot of money to the new, the newly reconstituted Assyrian Empire. The leaders of the Assyria, Assyria is the first of the big global unstoppable empires. The leaders of the Assyrian Empire this time, guys like Tiglat Pileser III, are not merely figures mentioned in the Bible or big figures in this particular kind of milieu. They are world figures in history. Tiglat Pileser is regarded as one of the great conquerors of the ancient world. Ahaz made a deal with Tiglath Pileser. Tiglath Pileser, using about probably just 1% of the Assyrian army, came and completely wiped out Aram. Aram ceased to exist as a nation after that. We're in a state of great flux, but Ahaz is very, very taken with Assyrian culture and <laughs> artifacts. And in fact, he gets, he gets a replica of a temple or, or an altar that he saw in Assyria gets made in for, for Jerusalem. He's kind of 
opening it up to all of this polytheistic syncretism once again that he really, really likes. But eventually Achaz dies. Actually, not even eventually. He wasn't king for that long. A few years. And then he is succeeded by the king we're going to look at at the end here. Hezekiah. Hezekiahu. If there are two or three righteous kings in the history of the Judean kingship up to this point, he is one of them. He is a very charismatic figure who attempts to effect some kind of spiritual and religious revolution. One of the things that he was doing, you see, one of the, one of the challenges for, the, for anyone trying to consolidate political and spiritual power in, in the land was the issue, or wanting to focus on Jerusalem, was this issue of Bamot. Anyone know what Bamot are? Bamot, we know the contemporary Hebrew, Hebrew word Bama means a stage or a platform. So the Bamot were special kind of nature platforms. Like, you know, the, the whole worship, like you see something on top of a high mountain, you go, oh, I'll go up there, there's very special energy, I'll sit up there, I'll make a special prayer up there and so on, or it might be a lovely tree by a spring, this kind of nature energy worship that was at specific locations. And people would go there, they would worship the God of Israel, but they would go there and do all sorts of, you know, they had their own minhagim going on there, their own customs and their own, their own nusach. Uh, and all sorts of strange things were happening at these places. And so often the prophets would say to the kings, you know, you might want to think about, you know, cleaning up the bamot a bit. So that was one of the things that Hezekiah did. And he was affecting another kind of spiritual revolution and trying to focus. He decided that he would have a great big Pesach. A great big Pesach. And everybody was going to come to this Pesach. Oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, before we talk about his Pesach, which will be right at the end, but before we talk about his Pesach. By the time you get to Hezekiahu, Hezekiahu, Ahaz and Hezekiahu, it wasn't just Aram that the Neo-Assyrians came and schmeist and ended, they also ended Israel. They ended the northern kingdom. Ended the northern kingdom. They crushed it from history. They took the ten tribes away. Gone. When we talk about ourselves being the Jewish people, or even Am Israel, the people of Israel, we're not really the full picture of the people of Israel. We are the Sheirita Pleta. We are simply the remnant that was remained behind after this immense cataclysm that happened in minus 720, approx, that is recorded right throughout the Middle East, not just in the Bible. The ethnic the destruction, defeat, and ethnic cleansing of the whole of the north of Israel. So, obviously, in that cataclysm, several tens of thousands of people had managed to get back over the border into Judah. And during this period, during Hezekiah's period particularly, the population of Jerusalem grew 15-fold. The creation of new suburbs. When you walk, for example, around the Armenian quarter today, right, that would have been a flash new suburb in the times of Hezekiah. And in order to shore up the defences of the newly enlarged Jerusalem, he built a wall. That wall today cuts right through the, uh, the old city. You can see it just at the end of the Jewish quarter. When it, and that's Hezekiah's wall. And you can still see that wall or the foundations of that wall. And that was kind of the size. If the old city goes like that now, that was probably the size of Hezekiah. It's probably the Armenian and the Jewish quarter together, what we have today. So, he decides to make a great big Pesach. So you've got lots and lots of people come to this Pesach. And amazingly, some of the people that turned up at this Pesach were ritually unclean. Why were they ritually unclean? What had happened to make them ritually unclean? It's because just prior to Passover, Hezekiah had commissioned some cleanup and renovation works on the Temple Mount to get rid of all the kind of idolatrous nonsense that his father had started doing up there 
And in the course of their digging, they came across... <laughs> some people are nodding. Well, what am I about to say? Do you know what I'm about to say? Do you know what they came across? Bodies. Sorry? Bodies. Close, but even more specific. They came across... It's really amazing. <laughs> the skull of Aravna, the Jebusite. As a result of which, several scores of people became unclean. The only way you could understand that is that they found the skull and they're going, oh, look at this, the skull of Arana. Oh, look at this. Oh, have a look, have a look at this. The skull. And it got passed around by like a hundred people before someone came along and said, ah, do you realize that actually that's making you unclean every time someone touches it, right? Oh, have a look, the skull of Aravna. The skull of Aravna appears right during this particular time and makes a whole lot of people kind of, so it's a nice kind of way of circling this point but the big 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 issue with Hezekiah and I know I've only got one minute but I've, if we don't do this uh, then we won't have really completed the picture here because <laughs> as you can imagine the kings of the Neo-Assyrian Empire the emperors you know like you know, Shalmaneser and Sargon and Sancherib it's it's not enough. They can't just have the biggest empire the world has ever seen so far and then just sit at home. If they don't go out every summer on some march of conquest, you know, they're leftists. So they're back 20 years later and they are conquering and they come on Judah and they destroy 46 cities, including famously the huge wipeout massacre destruction that happened at Lachish. The famous excavation. Lachish was the second biggest city in Judah. And we know about the destruction of Lachish, not just from the but we know about the destruction of Lachish in detail because the Assyrians painted it on their walls. You learn about the destruction of Lachish in the Assyrian archaeology. And the amazing thing, of course, is that Hezekiah got sent these letters by the Assyrian army, by the Assyrian commanders, saying, I mean, honestly, who do you think you are? Every single nation that we have conquered so far has said their God would protect them. And yet here we are at your doorstep. Surrender Jerusalem. We conquer Jerusalem and we'll save you the inevitable <laughs> massacre because nothing is going to stop you. We are the Assyrians. No, no, we've, no one's ever seen anything like us before. And indeed, the world hadn't. You know, after the Assyrians were going to come, the Babylonians, the Persians. And the, this was the first of that totally new shift into a different m way of military conquest. And Hezekiah realizes that this is the end. I mean, this is the end. This is if 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 the Assyrians destroy Jerusalem. Now, this is the end of Judaism. This is the end of Jewish history. And in these talks that I'm giving you tonight would be much much shorter. <laughs> and he takes these letters and he goes up to the top of the temple and he opens the letters up and he looks up and he goes God read if you're gonna do something you kind of need to do it now there is nothing we've prayed we've done everything I have fortified the city, I've strengthened the wall, I've built a wall around the Gihon Spring so that the enemy won't be able to use it during a siege. We've done, and I've, we've prayed again and we've done everything, we've fasted, we've nothing else to do, you're going to do it now. And famously, and this is of course encouraged by the prophet Isaiah, and then famously, the next morning, as Isaiah says, the people that had been in darkness suddenly saw a great light. One of the immense miracles of Jewish history, which historians acknowledge, but obviously discuss the cause of, they wake up the next morning and the Assyrian army is not there. According to some accounts, uh, a massive plague had gone through the army. Other accounts was a mutiny. Other accounts was they had to pick up their army and leave and go and fight a situation in Egypt. They, other accounts were that they, whatever reason, and all the other account being that an angel of the Lord came and slew them, which is what the Bible will tell you. Whatever it was, 
They weren't there. If you Google today, if you Google today the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and I've said this before, but it's no less amazing. There's the Mediterranean. Here's the Neo-Assyrian Empire and their conquests. They were enormous, except for one little pixel here. Jerusalem. They never conquered Jerusalem. It was, a, it was one non-Neo-Assyrian dot in this immense sea of the Neo-Assyrian conquest. Of course, within a century, the Assyrians themselves, who thought they would last forever, will be dust as is the nature of these things, and we're still here in Chabad House discussing Jewish history and talking about the country. You know, there's another 2,700 years to go for us until we get to this point, and we're not going away soon. <laughs> Hezekiah, however, obviously, famously to end it, he, uh, he got very sick and God told him he was going to die. He utters that incredible prayer uh, that you can read about. And uh, as Isaiah is leaving the building, he gets a call on the mobile from God. It's okay. Go back and tell him that uh, I'll give him another 15 years. As a result of this miraculous recovery, various dignitaries from around the Middle East began, came to Jerusalem to visit and congratulate him on recovery. You know, recovery from serious disease was not that common in the ancient world. And if you recovered from a disease that was terminal... People would come and look at you just to say, oh, wow, what did you do? You eat prunes? I mean, what, 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 what was the deal? <laughs> so, coconut water? <laughs> um, and one of the dignitaries that comes to visit him is a guy called Morodach Baladan, who is a kind of quasi-king, who comes to visit Nebuchadnezzar to pay his respects, and he comes from a place he, that, by, at that stage, no one in here, in the land of Israel, had really heard much about. A place called Babylon. And he, Hezekiah, cordially and diplomatically greeted him and took him on a tour of Jerusalem, in the course of which he showed him all of the great treasures of the temple. Boasting that, you know, look at what we've got in our temple. Look at how magnificent it is. Look at how... And Isaiah said to him, You should not have done that. Because his people will come back here. It's a bit like, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of those, you know, um, anyone follow the things that in astrophysics when they talk about the SETI program, right? The search for extraterrestrials. So, you know... We're searching the radio way, you know, bands for extraterrestrials or, and some people say, you know, well, what's the point of listening if we're not talking? So we should, we should send out our own powerful signal and see whatever. And some people go, you know, it may not be a brilliant idea to send out a powerful signal into the universe because there might be these benign aliens who come and visit us and share their technology and all that, or they might just see us as lunch. And similarly, Isaiah said to him, you know, you shouldn't have done that because his people will come back and they will take it all away. And that was kind of seen as the beginning, beginning, just right at the end of the life of Hezekiah, the beginning of the turmoil that is going to unravel what's going to happen. But what I wanted to do tonight was to fundamentally establish the first three centuries of the temple so we know what it is we're talking about. It is still the Solomonic building. It is sitting on the Temple Mount. By the way, that Temple Mount on top of the rock that we know is the Evin Hashdiah, the foundation stone, which legendarily is the foundation stone of the world. How long that rock has been there, we're not entirely sure. There's obviously parallel Islamic traditions about it and the well of souls and all the things that you can go and see if you were to look at that underneath. It's the, it's the, it sits underneath the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock is called the Dome of the Rock because it's the, it is the Dome of the uh, Rock. And that rock is sitting there. And that's pretty much where we understand the Holy of Holies was approximately. But that becomes a bit, what we're seeing right throughout this period is the tensions that are inherent between the kings attempting to solidify their own political power and the growing nature and influence and political pressure brought about by the priesthood. But at the end of the day, it always came back 
to the kings and their geopolitical machinations that were really the determining factor at this stage in Jewish history. That's all going to get shaken up next week. This has just been a kind of a preparatory grounding for the immense monumental things that are going to lead up to the final century of the temple of this first temple and how it came to be no more we're going to look at next week which is no less fascinating but thank you for following this and i hope that some of the things that have emerged tonight will make sense Goodbye. thank you for listening to find out more about david solomon's books recordings and classes or to support his work and teachings for just a few dollars a month visit davidsolomon.online